So I'd like to talk to today about uh, anachronisms in physics, uh, by which I mean elements of our, our physical theories which are there not um, as the result of a well thought out process of scientific reasoning, but simply for historical reasons or psychological reasons or even just because they've always been there. Um, and so, the, of course, although we'd all like to think that our theories are entirely the process of good scientific reasoning, um, when we stop to reflect, we can easily find uh, there are irrational or illogical elements in them. And indeed, um, we can see from the history of science that identifying and removing elements like that is often a good way of making scientific progress. Um, so, for example, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity can be sort of thought of as following from Einstein realising that um, the notion of absolute time was an anachronism of that kind. Um, it had been around for a long time, but mostly for sort of psychological reasons, and it had never really been well justified uh, or well understood. So, by getting rid of, rid of that anachronism from um, the way that Einstein thought about physics, he was able to make um, significant advances in our understanding of space and time. Um, so that, it's that kind of perspective which motivates the idea that perhaps um, by identifying further anachronisms in, in the way we think, think now about physics, in particular um, in the way we think about quantum mechanics, we might be able to advance our understanding of the subject and perhaps find a way around the difficulties which plague the interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, so I want to introduce uh, and put forward two, two possible elements of our theories which I think might be anachronisms of this kind. Um, so... Uh, not to keep you in suspense, those are going to be temporal locality and objective chance. So for each of those, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the historical context in the hope of convincing you that they are indeed um, there for not the right kind of reasons. I'll then uh, put them in the context of modern physics and um, try to understand how that, try to, uh, to convince you that they are indeed in tension with some things we know about modern physics. Um, and then finally, in each case, I'll explain why I think uh, the assumption is important, why I think it's um, uh, constricting the way in which we do physics, and how progress might be made by removing it. Um, so first off, uh, the notion of temporal locality. Uh, so of course, uh, since, the, since the discovery that quantum mechanics um, uh, violates Bell's theorem, um, it's been quite common to begin talking about a spatial uh, non-locality and to take seriously the idea that the world might contain spatial non-locality. Um, so that is, certainly not, certainly not all, physis all physicists and philosophers accept that um, Bell's, the violation of Bell's theorem does indeed imply the existence of spatial non-locality, but it's certainly uh, it's wi widely discussed and taken seriously as a possibility. Uh, we haven't, however, had the same kind of uh, change in our way of thinking with regard to what, what, what one might call temporal locality. Um, so it, the, to define temporal locality, what I've done here is basically just taken a standard definition of, of spatial locality and uh, made some appropriate replacements um, to change it from a temporal to a, from a spatial to a temporal concept. Um, so kind of... Uh, it, the, this, this, this is normally written as a sort of mathematical de decomposition between uh, the results of measurements in, uh, in the spatial case two places, or in the temporal case two times, and that's what's, what's expressed by this equation here. Kind of in loose terms, the idea of spatial locality is that um, the correlations between measurements made at two different space points um, must be mediated by uh, records in the states in the states of the, in the state of the systems at those two places, um, and any correlations must result from interactions, um, interactions that have occurred in the past, like in the common past, like kind of those, those two places, um, and with, with that information then, then being carried to the relevant space-time positions by the state. So the, the key idea of um, spatial locality is that there needs to be mediation by a state, um, and the. the the idea of temporal locality is basically, is basically the same thing. Uh, the, the thought is that um, if we have two measurements that are occurring at diff different uh, times, then any correlation between those two, the results of those measurements must be mediated by a state which carries the information um, about the, the, the past measurement forwards in time towards the future measurement. Um, so a world which is temporally non-local would be a world in which not all correlations across time are, are mediated by states in that way. To kind of uh, clarify that idea, I think it helps to, to consider some ways in which the world might possibly fail to be temporally local. Um, so one possibility is that the world could be governed by non-Markovian laws. So uh, mathematically we say that laws are non-Markovian uh, if they are memoryless. So that means that the evolution um, forwards from one moment, a given moment in time depends only on the state at that time and not on any past state. Conversely, non-Markovian laws um, 
have a dependence not only on, on, on a state at a single time, but also on some past states as well. Um, so if the world were in fact governed, governed by non-Markovian laws, um, there would be a dependence dependence of future evolution on facts about the past not recorded in the current state, and that would be a dependence that would fail to be mediated by a state in a temporary local way. So another possibility is retrocausality. Um, so that's the idea that, that events at, at a given time might depend on some facts about the future. Um, and so if those facts about the future are not, um, are not recorded in, and are not deducible from the current state of the world, um, but nonetheless have an influence on events at, at at that time, um, that would again be a form of temporal non-locality because that dependence would not be mediated by any information stored in some state. Um, and finally, the world could be governed by atemporal laws, by which I mean uh, laws which, for example, um, require that uh, some system takes a, a takes a path with, um, <coughs> takes takes a path and has a history which um, optimizes the value of some constraints, like an action or a Lagrangian. Um, so again, in that kind of picture, what happens at a given time depends on what's happening at all the other times uh, via this optimization of the constraint. But again, um, you don't need to have that information stored in the state at that time. The, the dependence is direct and comes from the, the atemporal maximization across time of this constraint uh, rather than from information carried forward by a mediating state. Um, so the key thing I, I want to note about those sort of three, three types of um, temporal non-locality is that they're all very much not mainstream. So they're not, they're not common ways of thinking about, about physics. And indeed, um, all of the sort of mainstream ways of thinking about the way the world works and the way physics works um, implicitly build in uh, temporal locality as an, as, a, as an assumption. So even, even though we now take seriously the possibility of spatial non-locality, we don't usually take seriously the notion of temporal, temporal non-locality. Um, so why is that? Why is the notion of temporal locality so very ubiquitous in physics? Uh, well, first off, um, th there are clearly pra pragmatic reasons for it. Uh, we ourselves are temporal creatures. We are constrained to live in a temporally directed way. We can influence the future only by, um, uh, only by uh, manipulating uh, the states of things in the present and expecting those states to go to get carry the information forward into the future in certain ways. Um, so. Uh, it's, it's, we, we, we ourselves are basically subject to temp constraints of temporal locality, and it's quite natural to suppose, um, in a sort of anthropomorphic way, that the laws of nature must be subject to similar constraints. Furthermore, we, of course, as, as scientists, we're most usually interested in writing down laws which explain um, how to influence the, the future by uh, manipulating things at, at the present. Um, and that means it's quite natural for us to write down laws which have a temporary local form because they're, they're most relevant to our practical interests. Um, and, and of course, it's quite natural to, to kind of move from that, the fact that scientists always write down laws of a certain form to the idea that, that the underlying laws of nature probably do actually have that form. Um, but there's no real reason to think that the laws of nature would reflect our practical interests in that in such an obvious way. Um, Another more psychological fact is the experience we all have of the present as being somehow specially privileged. Um, so we, 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 we experience the present as being special in some way, and it's quite natural to feel that that, that, that um, very basic fact of our experience must have a, some basis in objective fact. Uh, in its most extreme form, that view becomes the philosophical approach known as presentism, which says that the only things which really exist are the things that exist now. Um, and certainly someone who's, both a, who's a realist um, in the sense that they think the results of measurements do depend only on things that are real, um, and is also a presentist, will naturally be compelled to say, well, the results of measurements must be able to depend only on facts of, about the world um, at, in the present, and therefore they will naturally, naturally be led to a form of temporal locality. Um, now, I think most practicing physicists these days would not self-describe as presentists, but none nonetheless, this w way of thinking about the present as being specially privileged uh, is a very compelling one. It's quite a hard, hard um, thing to, to remove from our thought entirely, and it seems likely, therefore, that, that, that this way about, of thinking of the present as specially privileged um, has had an influence in the way that physicists think about physics and on uh, their tendency to assume temporal locality. Um, and then finally, I want to mention a sociological factor. Uh, so since, I guess, about the time of Newton, it's been very uh, common, almost sort of compulsory, to, to set out one's physical theories um, in the framework of kinematics and dynamics, uh, by which I mean the kinematics is, is usually defined as the set of states that is, that is 
postulated by a theory, and the dynamics is, the, is then uh, the set of laws postulated by the theory uh, by which those states are meant to evolve forward in time. Um, but once you put your theory into that form, you're more or less assuming temporal locality from the outset, the idea, because the whole point of the states is that they are that which carries information forwards in time um, according to the evolution under dynamical laws. Um, so by kind, uh, kind of insisting on this formulation of this formulation as a reasonable, as the way all reasonable physical theories should look, we, um, we've, this physics community has more or less forced itself to go down the route of temporal locality without really reflecting on whether that's the most appropriate notion. Um, uh, so it's quite easy then to explain in historical terms, in psychological terms, and in sociological terms why we would why we would make this assumption. Um, but n but notice that none of these ex explanations for the assumption of temporal locality says anything about um, whether temporal locality is really true of the world. None of these explanations are justifications for that for that for holding that belief. Um, and I think it's a f fairly reasonable principle of, of reasoning that um, if you can easily just easily explain why you hold a belief but you can't easily justify that belief, it's probably time to take a, uh, another look at whether that's a good belief. Um, so that's what I want to do now. I want to consider, um, does temporal locality really make sense within the context of modern physics and what we know about modern physics? Um, so... You may, you may recall that when I, as I defined temporal locality, I had to refer to the state of the world at, at, at a given time. So the, the idea of temporal locality is that measurements at a given time depend only on the state of the world at a given time. Now that's problematic because uh, the state of the world at a given time is not even a well-defined concept within special relativity. So the state of the world at a given time um, the, what, that, what that would mean depends on which frame of reference you're, you're, you're um, asking the question from. So it, different frames of reference will define different slices across time um, and each of those will have a different state on it. So saying that the state of that um, the result of a measurement should, should depend only on the state of the world at the time of the measurement isn't even really a meaningful thing to say within special relativity. Now that's not actually a problem if you're going to insist that your theories must be both spatially and temporally local uh, because that, that then implies that the result of a measurement should depend only on the state of the world at the space-time location of the measurement. And of course a single space-time point, a single space-time location is well defined within special relativity. Um, but if you, if you try to put together spatial, the, uh, the, a belief in spatial non-locality um, with a belief in temporal locality and you also believe that the world is relativistic, you very straightforwardly um, End up, end up with contradictions. So it seems that um, what, what it seems then that if, if we are going to take seriously the notion of spatial non-locality, and we do believe that the world is relativistic, we're more or less compelled to also take seriously the notion of temporal non-locality um, and to accept that that um, if we we don't need uh, states to mediate influences across space, we then also don't need states to mediate, mediate influences across time. I think this picture becomes even clearer when we move to general relativity, um, and that's because uh, the solution to Einstein's field equations within general relativity is not a state of the world um, at a given time. The solution to Einstein's field equations uh, is an entire history of the world. Um, it, it is an entire history of the world, and that means that in that the sort of standard formulation of general, general relativity, what we have is precisely an atemporal theory of the kind I was describing earlier. Um, so uh, certainly the most natural way of interpreting general re relativity is to say that general re relativity um, applies in an atemporal way, way to the world all at once. It determines kind of the, the, the shape of the inter the whole of space-time all at once, um, and therefore it naturally incorporates uh, spa temporally non-local influences um, in the way that it, it affects the unfolding of, of events. Um, I should note at this point, however, uh, that uh, it is also possible to write down initial value formulations of general relativity. So to do that, what, what you do is you take the field equations of general relativity and you split them into two parts. And one, one part becomes a set of constraint equations which governs uh, what possible initial states the world is allowed to have, and the other, other half becomes a set of dynamical equations um, by which those states evolve forward in time. Uh, so we can write down general relativity in a form that looks like a temporally local theory. However, um, 
an important difference in this context is that uh, the initial conditions and the dynamics are no longer in independent in, in the way that they are supposed to be in the sort of kinematic dynamics framework. Um, and that's because it's, it's important to the overall coherence of this approach that uh, the, the constraint equations must be such that um, all of the allowed initial conditions are taken by the dynamical equations into other, other states which still belong to the allowed set of states. Um, otherwise, we just straightforwardly have a contradiction. Um, which means that uh, there's a kind of non temporal non locality being built in implicitly behind the scenes, um, in, that, in that what initial states are allowed depends in some sense on what those states are going to evolve to later in, in the course of history. So um, we, we no longer have a sense, have, have the same, same kind of a situation where you can input any initial state and it's just taken forward. Um, by the dynamical evolution, that the, the initial state depends in an intrinsic way on states later, later in time. And so in that sense, um, the, the initial value formulation looks, like it's, looks a bit like it's just a way of trying to hide the, the temporal non-locality of the theory. Um, and it, it seems to me that properly interpreted general, general relativity is telling us that temporal locality is a real feature of the world. Um, a further thing to note here is that both in classical physics and in uh, quantum physics, we've always had kind of two formulations available to us, um, two ways in which we can write down the theory. So um, in both cases, we have what one might refer to as a Newtonian schema, where, um, and so that's a formulation where we have a state at a given time, we have laws which evolve the state forward in time, everything is temporally local. Um, but in both the classical physics and quantum physics, there's also what one might refer to as the Newtonian schema, um, schema where um, the, the, the path taken by the, the system is uh, determined by optimizing some constraint, such as the action uh, or the Lagrangian, over the whole course of the history. Um, so it's always possible to convert in between those two formulations. So the mere existence of the Lagrangian schema doesn't tell us that these theories must be interpreted as being temporally non-local. Um, however, uh, it's interesting to me that more or less um, since the birth of classical physics, it's always been traditional to, to regard the, uh, the Newtonian picture as being the picture which is which is which corresponds to reality. Uh, so the Newtonian schema is usually taken seriously as um, an, at an attempt at saying what the world is really like, and the Lagrangian schema is usually regarded as a sort of convenient calculational device that makes us it e us makes it easier for us to do certain sorts of calculations, but isn't really supposed to be taken seriously as a description of reality. Um, however, there doesn't really seem to be any good reason for this, this philosophical um, presupposition. The, on, um, the only explanation for it that I can see um, certain, as, uh, it is as a result of our pre-existing prejudice in favour of temporal locality. Um, it's certainly not really ever justified or given um, any sort of backing in, in the literature. Um, so, Given what we now know about the way in which uh, temporal locality, uh, temporal locality is problematic and has tensions um, when we try to place it within the context of modern physics, I think we have we have good reason to go back and and um, reconsider that that presupposition um, to reconsider whether perhaps we should have been taking the Lagrangian schema um, seriously as a description of reality all along. Okay, so at this point you might be saying this is all very well, but does any any of it really matter? After all might one not say that the difference between temporal locality and temporal non-locality is perhaps just kind of a, a it's, just, it's just about language, it's not really a, a meaningful question, and even if it is, how will we ever tell, what difference will it make to our ways of doing physics? Um, so I do th I think it is very important, uh, b because um, which approach one adopts in terms of believing in temporal locality or temporal non-locality has a very significant effect on the way in which we do physics and the types of physical theories we allow ourselves to contemplate. Um, so as an example of that, I want to think about the effect that the assumption of temporal locality has had, um, particularly on the field of quantum foundations in recent years. Um, so most of the, the really big and important results of the field of quantum foundations recently have been derived within what's known as the ontological models framework. Um, and so that's a method of analysis due to, due to Rob Speckins, um, in which one assumes that every theory has a set of possible um, underlying real or object states, um, and then when, when we perform a measurement on the system, uh, the result of that measurement is determined by a response function, which, which 
um, says that given that the system is in some underlying ontic state, the probabilities of various outcomes are as follows. Um, so the ontological model is described by a set of um, ont ont ontic states, a set of response functions, and then also a set of uh, preparation functions which tell us with what probability does the system end up in various ontic states when we perform various different possible pre preparation procedures. Um, so this is quite a, a very powerful framework. We can uh, derive a lot of very interesting results um, within that framework. Um, and basically all those results are kind of telling us, um, given that we know quantum mechanics looks a certain way, given we know quantum systems are based certain statistics, what can we conclude about the underlying space of ontic states? Um, uh, so that framework has been use, used in recent years to derive a large variety of, uh, of interesting results. Indeed, I think more or less all the really big results of, this, of the field um, sort of fall within that category. So, for example, Speckins' generalised process of contextuality are in this framework, and the colbeck renner theorem is in this framework, and the PBR theorem, which is perhaps the biggest result of quantum relations re in recent years, is, is also in this framework. Um, so, all of these results depend... Uh, depend absolutely on, on, this, on this method of analysis. Um, and that's problematic because the whole the ontological models framework depends um, explicitly on the notion of temporal locality because the ontic states are understood to be the states of the system at, the given, at a given time, at the time of measurement. And so um, the whole method of analysing things by considering ontological models um, assumes that temporal locality is a good way of describing the world. Um, all of these re results become either just... either incomprehensible or have very different meanings um, when one takes away that assumption. Uh, so for example, the PBR theorem is a theorem which says, um, loosely speaking, uh, the quantum state must be, the quantum state must be real, um, because if the quantum state, uh, if the true underlying ontic states of the system contain less information than the, uh, the quantum state does, then there would be scenarios in which we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't possibly be able to see the, see the results that we do in fact see in quantum theory. Um, and the proof of that proceeds, um, loosely speaking, like this. Suppose we have um, some measuring device which, which can perform four different measure, uh, preparation procedures. Sorry, we, we have some pre preparation device which can perform four different preparation procedures. We then have a measurement device which can perform a range of different measurements. Um, let's suppose then that um, these preparation pr procedures um, sometimes produce states which overlap in a certain way. Um, we can then show mathematically that if that were the case, the measurement uh, measuring device sometimes wouldn't be able to distinguish between preparation procedures um, in the way that it actually does in quantum theory. Um, and we conclude, therefore, that the underlying ontic state uh, must contain all the information that the quantum state contains. Um, and now that's fine, but the argument for that depends implicitly, on, or, or, depends, of course, on the assumption that the measuring uh, apparatus can gain information about the preparation procedure only via the mediating ontic states. Um, it's not allowed to look directly at, at the preparation procedure to see what preparation was, was carried out. Um, and so that whole result depends, very, depends intrinsically on the assumption that uh, information is only carried by the mediating state. Um, the, the whole result is pointless if you, if you don't assume in, in that um, dependence must be mediated in that way. Um, so what we see then is basically the entire field of quantum foundations for the last 15 years or so has been entirely predicated on this notion of temporal locality. Um, and if, in fact, temporal locality is not a good description of the world, basically all the work that's been done in those last 15 years is pointless. Um, that means that we can't, we can't regard this assumption of temporal locality as being sort of just a harmless simplification that maybe we'll, we'll get rid of later when we've figured some stuff out, because the assumption is... is all of the work that, that's being done in this field, um, it will be of no use when that assumption is moved aside. So if, to make further progress in that field, the assumption we need to let go of the assumption now and not wait until things are clearer at some point in the future. Um, a, a further way in which the assumption of temporal locality has affected quantum foundations is that all the big mainstream in interpretations of quantum mechanics, uh, so the collapse models, the de Broglie-Bohm approach, the Everett interpretation, all of these are explicitly temporally lo local in their uh, normal way of being stated. Uh, it's possible that one could come up with temporally non-local formulations of them, but certainly that's not the way they're normally written down, um, and I don't think that's the way that anyone currently thinks of them. Um, and that's important because it seems entirely possible that uh, were we to, to, that, that um, since 
we've c currently been constraining ourselves to temporally local interpretations of quantum theory, there's probably quite a large space of possible uh, temporally non-local interpretations that hasn't been well explored. Um, indeed, there are now people starting to work on uh, some replicable causal approaches or some um, t atemporal approaches, and some interesting things have been done in that regard, but th those are very much um, considered off the beaten track and not uh, really taken seriously or, um, um, or um, <coughs> studied by very many people. Um, and I would suggest that uh, if, if we get rid of the assumption of temporal locality, uh, those, those approaches might receive more attention and might therefore um, might in, in, indeed turn out to be the correct way to go to resolve this vexed question of interpretation. Um, finally, there's an important consequence of this notion of temporal locality for the, the, the community of people working on retrocausality. Uh, so the notion of retrocausality has, has um, uh, received quite a lot of attention in recent years. Uh, for example, there's a result uh, due to um, uh, um, QC and LIFA um, based on uh, based on a, a result originally due to Price, which um, says that basically any time symmetric formulation of quantum theory um, must be, but for a certain notion of time symmetry, must incorporate retrocausality. Um, but that's, that, that result has sparked um, renewed interest in the, the notion of retrocausality, and there are now quite a few people considering that and taking it seriously. However, I think in, um, progress in this area is being impeded by the fact that there are two distinct ways of thinking about re what retrocausality might be. Um, so the first is kind of akin to the, the two-state vector formulation of quantum theory. So the idea there is that we kind of have um, a forward-evolving forward state or a forward's arrow of time, um, a forward's causality. But then we also have kind of a backwards-evolving state or a, for a backwards causality. Um, and, and those two directions, dire directions of influence and in some way interact um, at, at, a, at a given time to produce the result of a measurement. Um, now that's problematic for a number of reasons. Um, mo particularly because in order to make that work, you have to be very careful about what information is contained in the forwards evolving state and what information is evolved in the, contained in the backwards evolving state, because of course you have to make sure that they never say contradictory things about what's going to happen at a given time. So that there's a, quite a careful balancing act that has to be, um, that has to be imposed on, on such ways of thinking about retrocausality to ensure that they are self-consistent. Um, that balancing act looks very implausible to many people. Um, it seems like a kind of um, unrealistic fine tuning. Um, and, and, uh, th and it's this, I think, which causes a lot of people to find retrocausality um, uh, untenable and, and to, to kind of reject, reject it out of hand. Uh, however, the other way of thinking about retrocausality is kind of more and more towards the atemporal stuff that I was talking about earlier. So, Obviously, in a theory in which um, the course of history is determined by maximizing con some constraint over the whole of history, uh, the, the, the present will depend on the future in a certain way, um, but that, but that um, dependence is not mediated by a backwards evolving state or a backwards causality or a backwards error of time. It's just a direct, temporally non-local dependence. Um, and, so the, and so that, uh, the, the sort of the first, um, Two, two direction of time arrow type of causality is, is in some sense a temporary local theory in that um, in the dependence from the past and the future is mediated, uh, whereas the second way of thinking about retrocausality um, within the sort of a temporal picture is a temporally non-local approach um, in which uh, the dependence of the, of the present on the future is not mediated. Um, and I, I personally think that the second way of thinking about retrocausality is much more plausible. Um, it's uh, doesn't require that kind of fine-tuning or balancing act, um, and it, it draws on approaches that we, we're already familiar with, like, like using Lagrangians and, and actions. Um, so I think the retrocausality community would be, would be well served to first off um, distinguish clearly in their work between these two types of retrocausality, um, so that people, people, people understand their options on the table. And I personally also, also think that, that the best thing to do would be to come out explicitly in favour of the second type of retrocausality and say explicitly, this is, this is what we mean by retrocausality. We're not talking about two arrows of time or two types of causality. We're just talking about a kind of global atemporal approach like a Lagrangian on a very large scale. Um, so that, 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 that's just the field of quantum foundations, but that is, is, I think, a number of ways in which the assumption of temporal locality is really having a problematic that effect on uh, that field, and um, the field could, I think, benefit very much from certainly more discussion of the notion of temporal locality and ideally getting rid of that notion. Um, and I, 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 
and not an expert on other on other areas, but I would imagine that there are many other areas of physics which would similarly benefit from getting rid of that assumption. Okay, so I now want to move on to my second anachronism, which is the notion of objective chance. Uh, so what do I mean by objective chance? Uh, so you probably all know that, that there's, there's always been this, there's been this distinction that exists within philosophy between subjective chances and objective chances. Um, but exactly how that distinction, th th there are as many different ways of making the distinction as there are philosophers of probability. Um, so in order to be clear, have clarity here, I'm just going to stipulate now what, what I mean by that distinction, and that's what I will mean um, going forwards when I use those terms. So by objective chance, I mean uh, fundamental and irreducible probabilities, such as those which appear in fundamentally indeterministic laws of nature. Um, and by subjective probability, I mean basically everything else. So relative frequencies, ensemble averages, ignorance probabilities, any, any type of probability that is not enshrined in fundamental laws of nature is, is going to be a subjective probability. And the thing I want to draw your attention to then is that um, by this particular definition of objective chance, it seems, at least in our current understanding of physics, that quantum probabilities are really the only genuine objective chances. So all the other probabilities which appear in physics can in some sense be reduced to ensemble frequencies or ignorance probabilities or something like that. Um, as far, um, quantum probabilities are the only, only ones which seem to have some, which, which seem like they might be objective chances. Now, of course, not all interpretations of quantum mechanics tell us that quantum probabilities are objective chances. The Everett interpretation, for example, doesn't do that. Um, the de Broglie doesn't, interpretation doesn't do that. But um, and a number of important inter interpretations do uh, regard them that way. So, for example, uh, wave function collapse models um, require the notion that uh, the probability of a collapse is an objective chance. It's just fundamentally been built into the laws of nature. It doesn't depend on anything else. Um, and I think more broadly, more broadly uh, even those, those physicists, physicists who aren't particularly interested in interpretation and don't subscribe to one interpretation or another, I think most of them would, would nonetheless say that they, believe, they regard quantum probabilities as being objective chances. And they will, for example, point you to various no-go theorems um, which pur purport to say that, uh, that quantum mechanics must necessarily be a fully... Be a, a, a inherently indeterministic theory and therefore the, the probabilities... In, that are used within quantum mechanics must be objective chances. So I'd now like to have a think about some of the origins of this notion of objective chance. Uh, so kind of informal thinking about probabilities of various kinds have been sort of part of uh, human thought since the dawn of time. Um, but uh, probability as a sort of formal mathematical notion began to emerge in the 16th century with the work of Cardano, um, and then in the 17th century with the work of Pascal and Fermat. Um, and what I want to reinforce is that, um, th that the idea of there being two different types of probability has been around since the very start. Uh, so ba back, even back in this, this very early age of probability, um, there was always this sense that we had, in some sense, sort of the real probabilities that are out there in the world, and then the other probabilities which are, which are in some sense, just in our heads. Um, so for a... a Nice analysis, nice analysis of all the sort of detailed textual evidence for that. You can look in, into hacking. Um, but for example, um, we see Laplace in, I guess, the 19th century writing this essay concerning the unknown inequalities which may exist among chances which are supposed to be equal. So that, that kind of language clearly shows a consciousness of the idea that there are different types of chances, that there are the chances which are, which are really there and the chances as they are supposed to be in our heads. Uh, so this, the, this duality of probability has been um, with us from the very start. And when you stop to think about it, that's really very surprising, because if it is indeed the case that the only real objective probabilities are the quantum ones, um, our ancestors, when they were coming up with the concept of probability, could never have had any, any interaction with any, any actual objective chances. And um, that's because uh, we know that, that quantum decoherence effectively washes out the effect of quantum probabilities, so that on, on a macroscopic level, um, we, the quantum probabilities don't have any effect on observable phenomena. Um, there is, I, I guess, I, should, I guess, some, content, some point of contention there because some people might say that certain of the probabilities that we see in statistical mechanics um, and so on have some, have quantum origins, uh, but that's not really that's not really relevant to uh, the formation to the point here because the paradigmatic examples of uh, probabilities on which the, the, the mathematical theory of probability had its origins were all things like uh, rolling die. Um, uh, drawing cards from a deck and games of chance, and then other things like um, 
our understanding of health, our understanding of crop survival, disease, practical measures, all of these things um, are phenomena which I think most, very few physicists would say are influenced in a direct way by quantum probabilities. And so that means that all of the phenomena that are on which the, pro pro the, the notion of um, probability was developed um, were, not, didn't, were not in fact objective chances in any way um, and indeed our ancestors really had no interaction with objective chances when they were coming up with this notion of objective chance. Um, and so that's really very weird and mysterious um, that they should somehow have managed to come up with this concept, concept of objective chance which in fact uh, supposedly perfectly describes a feature of quantum mechanics which was a theory that was some hundreds of years, years to the future. Um, it, and uh, that, that to me seems a very implausible thing to believe. Um, indeed, I think there are some sort of views of the nature of reference on which, uh, which one would argue that, it, that this is impossible. So, for example, uh, if you subscribe to a causal theory of reference, uh, then you would probably want to argue something like um, it's just not possible that our ancestors could have come up with a concept correctly referring to the notion of objective chance um, if objective chances did not, in fact, play an appropriate causal role in the formulation of that concept. Um, I don't want to go that far because I don't want to tie this argument to some particular notion of particular theory of reference, but nonetheless I think it's very striking and, and, and um, problematic that we, our ancestors are supposed to have come up with this concept of ob objective chance um, several hundred years in advance of e ever observing or discovering real objective chances. I think a more uh, plausible account of what happened is this. Uh, Basically, we started doing the founding experiments of quantum mechanics. We found ourselves writing down laws which referred to pro probabilities. Um, and initially, we tried to uh, kind of explain away those probabilities by reference to some underlying theory which would make those probabilities subjective ones, as we had done with other probabilities in the past, like the probabilities of um, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Um, but for various reasons, in the case of quantum mechanics, that's much more difficult. Um, the theory has a structure which kind of resists being... Uh, being explained away in that, in that sense. Um, and so because this task was, was more difficult than usual, uh, we just eventually gave up. We attached to these probabilities the label of objective chance um, uh, to kind of hide the fact that we didn't really understand them. Um, and fortunately, because this, this, this notion of objective chance had been floating around in the public consciousness for some time, it seemed like a very familiar one. It seemed like it felt to people like they knew what they were talking about when they said quantum probabilities are objective chances. And therefore, no one really realised that what was going on here was that physicists were introducing into physics a radically new type of probability, something that hadn't, hadn't ever appeared in our theories of the world before. It felt like, felt like they were just using something that we already understood and knew, and knew about, and therefore this notion didn't really uh, receive the kind of analysis it ought to have, to have had. Um, so I should stop at this point to address a, an argument that physicists will often raise when you uh, mention stuff like this, which is that there are, are these no-go theorems which are supposed to prove once and for all that quantum mechanics must be fundamentally indeterministic. Uh, so one thing that's often mentioned in this regard is Bell's theorem. Um, so Bell's theorem, uh, the theorem, some physicists will say, tells us that no uh, local de deterministic theory of um, theory can possibly explain the correlations of quantum mechanics, um, and therefore quantum mechanics must be indeterministic. Um, but I think it's now well understood in the literature on Bell's theorem that actually Bell's theorem just says that no uh, local theory can explain the correlations of quantum mechanics. So determinism is really totally irrelevant to the conclusion of that theorem. Um, so Bell's theorem certainly doesn't rule out a deterministic theory. Um, a more uh, interesting one in this context is the quotient speaker theorem. Uh, so the quotient speaker theorem um, uh, starts from the, the starts from the observation that there are um, for quantum systems of, of dimensions higher than two, uh, there exist quantum measurement operators uh, which which occur in more than one uh, possible measurement that would, can be performed. Um, so measurement operators here are not, is, can be understood to mean types of measurement outcomes. So diff there are certain measurement outcomes which can can um, arise from different possible measurements. The quotient specken theorem uh, then proves mathematically that it's possible to come up with sets of um, quantum measurements such that uh, there is no way that we can uh, assign the numbers 1 and 0 to all the, the measurement um, elements involved in these, measurement, these different measurements such that every measurement contains exactly one element assigned the value 1 and all the other elements are given the value 0. Uh, so why is that problematic? It's problematic because if you think about measurement outcomes um, as being each associated with underlying, with, um, underlying properties that are, of quantum systems that they deterministically have or don't have, um, then you would, ex would indeed expect that in every measure possible measurement, um, exactly one element has the, pro the um, 
is, can be assigned the value 1, that's the property that the system does in, in fact have, and the, the, therefore you will deterministically get that result when you do that measurement. Um, and then all the other, uh, other measurement elements for that measurement should be assigned 0 because the, property, the system doesn't have that property and you won't get that result when you do that measurement. Um, so what the quotient speaker theorem tells us is that we can't um, explain quantum mechanics uh, in terms of an underlying theory in which um, all, measurement, all measurement outcomes correspond to properties of systems that systems deterministically have or not have. So it is, it is true the quotient speaker theorem tells us that quantum mechanics um, can't, be, uh, can't be, be explained by a deterministic theory of that particular form. Um, but that, it doesn't necessarily follow that quantum mechanics must be um, inherently indeterministic. Um, another way of looking at that result is just to say that we shouldn't be so naive about how we, how we interpret our mathematical formalism. Um, there's no reason to think that uh, the mathematical object, a measurement uh, operator, must correspond to a property of a system. That's, uh, that's just too simplistic a way of thinking about, uh, about how quantum uh, measurement operators relate to reality, and we, we need to have a more sophisticated way of thinking about what a measurement operator really means. Um, but the fact we don't have to think that way doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the only alternative is indeterminism. So I don't think either of these no-go theorems really does anything to mitigate against the possibility that quantum mechanics um, can in fact be explained by some deterministic theory. Uh, yeah, so why does, that, does, why does all of this matter? I think it matters because um, people who, who advocate interpretations of quantum mechanics, which, which rely on objective chance, like the collapse models, for example, um, are very seldom asked to provide a definition of, or analysis of what they mean by objective chance. Because we all kind of feel like we know what objective chance means. We're, we're familiar with chances, we're familiar with probabilities, and so it seems like the notion of objective chances is a perfectly meaningful one, um, and we don't tend to ask many more questions about what do you really mean that the, pro that the wave function collapses with some probability x. Um, but actually, of course, as anyone who does the philosophy of probability will know, it's quite difficult to come up with any satisfactory um, uh, analysis of what objective chances might really be. Um, various proposals have been made all, uh, over the years. They all seem to have quite serious problems. Um, certainly none is, is anywhere near universally accepted by philosophers of probability. Um, and therefore, it seems entirely possible that there just is no coherent um, definition of what objective chances are. If that's the case, then all of these um, interpretations that involve objective chance um, rest at heart on a notion which isn't even a, even a coherent one, um, and that would be a very good reason to think they're wrong. So um, I would argue that objective chance, when it's used in a possible interpretation of quantum mechanics, shouldn't be just accepted as a thing that we already understand. It should be treated as a, kind of, as a new concept that, that, that proponents of this interpretation are proposing to bring into physics, um, and it should therefore be subject to the same kind of scrutiny that we would, we would apply to any other radically new concept that someone wanted to um, use to explain that interpretation of quantum mechanics. Yeah, um, so that's basically what I had to say. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that, uh, that these two features of our current way of thinking of physics are at, at least problematic and perhaps um, uh, deserve to, have, uh, to be discussed more than they are. Um, I also hope that, that more broadly I've convinced you that this method of thinking about physics is useful um, and, and that perhaps you can consider what other features of, of our current way of thinking about physics might likewise be um, what I call anachronisms and might, would be uh, useful to get rid of. So, thank you. Thank you.